And so uh, I don't want to waste your time at all. We've got about 60 slides, and if we can get through those, I've got some additional materials. So I'm going to fill up this time. Um, I'm very comfortable with this material, so f please feel free to ask questions at any point, short questions, uh, and it may take some effort to get my attention, but so if you stand up and wave your arms, I'd be happy to, uh, you know, uh, take your comments and actually I'd probably be more interested in those in these material because I've already seen this so I really would value your feedback so anyway um, what we want to get down to is uh, internals of event logging on Vista and there's some radical changes in both the component architecture and the encodings and that's really what we want to talk about but in in the process, we want to kind of put things in perspective. And all of this relates not just to forensics, but um, the, the, uh, the, one of the central issues of doing forensics is interpreting. Um, th this is mostly static analysis, but interpreting what has gone on from the on the system from artifacts that you can recover. And that depends in large part on your ability to interpret the data. And uh, so understanding how the system works and what the encodings mean is, is something that's shared with a lot of other disciplines. So this relates to a lot of, you know, all the other areas of security. And, it, but, and in the same way, it borrows from all the knowledge that you might use in those other areas. So it's all tied together. So that's kind of, that's a little bit of perspective. I'm going to back up and give you an introduction now. This is uh, sp my sponsor who paid my travel costs. They are a forensics and data rec uh, recovery service company in Houston. So they do also do technology consulting. And uh, just so you know, this is not legal advice. Um, we're not going to talk that much about the law here, but in, in case we do mention something about how the law, law applies, and we do do expert testimony, but um, this is not that. Uh, I want to uh, recognize a couple of people who've helped us over the years. Uh, Caesar and MD5 of the Ghetto Hackers. All the guys from Houston, HT Mapathy, who are here and have been going to DEF CON for years saying, man, when we get back to Houston, we're going to get together a team. And they're beginning to do that. Dark Tangent for making this conference, which is the best among all the others, happen. And Fed Naughty, who I really should be over at Capture the Flag with right now. And uh, thanks to Geraldine Waters at ACUS, who's been a, a, an ex excellent technical editor, uh, Josh Pinnell at IO Active, and Matthew Geiger at CERT, who, who helped me uh, decide to begin some of this research. Um, and one of the guys with HT Matthew, who isn't here this year because he's over in the Middle East. So we miss him, and he misses us, and this talk is dedicated to him. So this, this stuff may be skewed slightly because of my perspective. And I tend to look at everything as research and development. Uh, my background is a PhD in EE. I was on the faculty of a medical school for a while. So I did research, went into industry, um, dot com boom, uh, with a security uh, management company. And uh, still want to keep my hand in the game in terms of understanding the field. And the way you do that is through services. So I'm doing forensics with uh, applied cognitive solutions. Uh, along the way, I've also written some free software, uh, GNU graphics. Um, I'm a contributing author to Asterisk. I was on the FreeBSD co uh, core team and the X386 core team. So those, those are the kinds of things I do. So I look at a lot of these issues. Uh, um, problems as a question of uh, understanding the mechanisms and writing new tools to automate the processes. So I want to talk for just a minute about how to catch up. We're going to talk about things that are not in print yet, but if you want to get a, get a handle on uh, this kind, these kinds of um, uh, processes and tasks, uh, this is the body of literature you might look at to try and get a handle on forensics and log forensics in particular. So one of the, the uh, leading certification in the field is NCASE, and uh, they have a study guide which will take you, it's probably the best book out there, although 10% of it is uh, uh, mostly errors. But, uh, but it's the best book to teach you kind of a, a survey of all the kinds of tasks that you might do for static analysis of a hard drive. 
Um, there are some newer books. Um, the one on the bottom r left is uh, by Bunting as well, Mastering uh, Windows Network Forensics and Investigation, and it talks uh, about more about Windows artifacts, all the different kinds of file formats that you want that you might analyze. Um, still, some newer a newer book is Windows for Incident. Forensics and Incident Recovery by Harlan Carvey, and it um, it goes beyond these other tools because it uses Perl uh, to uh, add new capabilities to um, extracting data and auto automating things. So those two books are probably the most recent that you can find on this kind of work. Um, along with that, there's. Uh, some more specific material on Windows event logging, but it's for older versions of the operating system. But it will tell you how, what the, what the, about things that are backward compatible and still valid on Vista. And finally, if you want to find out where the field is going, there's a really good journal that's three or four years old called Dig Digital Investigation. So those are the materials you might look at to catch up on what's going on and uh, with Digital Investigation Get Ahead. Um, Stephen Bunting has a website where he's published some materials about uh, recovering event logs. So there are various levels that you might, uh, with which you might recover event log information. Intact files in the file system, uh, data carving whole files, recovering fragments, and uh, his, this is some of the most recent uh, material, uh, information on manual methods. I mentioned Harlan Carvey's books. Uh, he covers a lot of different artifacts that the other books don't cover, and uh, how to write scripts, mostly Perl, uh, to parse the data and analyze it. And uh, probably the, there's more about event logging in uh, Bunting's book, Bunting's more recent book. But when they get to the uh, uh, question of log repair, so if you if you recover logs and they're not uh, intact, they say there's there are no methods uh, for for doing the repair, and that's what this talk is about: understanding the encodings and figuring how to do how to go farther with extracting the data and analyzing it. So we're kind of at the edge of what is published, and. The new work, uh, there's some new work that uh, you will see that is coming out in a digital investigation. In fact, I have a paper coming out in two weeks that is on uh, Windows XP. And that's one of the reasons I'm not going to talk about XP today, because uh, I can't talk about it for another two weeks. And I'm not going to talk about automation either. So um, if you want to know about some uh, auto method, method, automated methods to do what we're going to talk about. That paper is available. Um, you can give, send, give me your email address um, uh, or send me an email and I can send it to you. Okay, so back to our outline. We're going to talk about uh, event log analysis from the perspective of a case study. And this, this is representative of the kinds of work that that uh, our company does for intellectual property disputes. And uh, so this will provide us some motivation for, you know, what kind of questions we're trying to answer and what, what we're trying to get out of the analysis. And, and uh, then as a part of that, that's going to motivate us to do, uh, to extend the capabilities or go beyond the limitations of the current tools and then at the end put it together and, and uh, see how that impacts the kinds of answers we can come up with. So let's look at, the, at, at a typical process for an engagement. Uh, we can break it down into three phases in terms of how we interact with the customer. Um, we do civil only. We're mostly dealing with corporations who demand uh, a certain amount of control and uh, estimates for work. So very often we'll begin the engagement with an estimate of work that tells them what kind of things we can, that we know we can do without having any information about what's in the data in advance. So we'll provide a preliminary scope of, of work and it'll t tell them what's feasible, what we know we can do with the tools, what we can do quickly, uh, and generally it will provide them a uh, pre preliminary report and 
almost always in the preliminary port there are some surprises. You find out, you know, because there are so many levels of uh, uh, methods for recovery uh, and varying amounts of effort that go with it, it depends on what you find in the data as to how much effort it's going to take to tie all the pieces together. So there are almost always surprises and uh, the, the trick is to come up with ways to get to, to uh, go from step two to a final report in a way that's going to be feasible. The final report should provide some kind of in-depth coverage. So you want to be able to say, well, there was one indication that X happened, but you, you, you want to also be able to say something about whether the rest of the 100 gigabytes or so or whatever for da of data for, say, an individual machine doesn't indicate that there aren't it could be explained in another way. So you want to have enough coverage that you can say that a single uh, item indis indicates something clearly or not. And um, you may need to adapt the methods uh, to do that. So uh, typically you're going to be contacted by a corporate officer. Something bad has happened, uh, business interference, uh, possible contract violation and very often what we deal with is uh, um, proprietary information going out and being used by someone in violation of you know uh, agreements and uh, very often it's former employees who had in that use that information as a part of their job uh, uh, part of their, their role as uh, what they did for the company so it's not enough to show that they had the information. You have what you want to be able to distinguish whether someone took the information out in a specific kind of way at a specific time that show and, and discriminate between uh, uh, things that are things that were part of their job and should have been, and things that weren't. So the first task is to define a scope of work. What what kinds of things can we identify where we could show outgoing file transfer? Um, we can examine hard drives. That's the most typical thing we do. Uh, we can look for email attachments, email going out, uh, uploads, um, file transfers, um, and there are various other kinds of things that you can do, that, uh, ways, of, ways that the information could be transferred out. So uh, let's uh, consider a typical preliminary report. Uh, we look at the hard drive, and uh, we, the, the client may have told us things to look for. He may, they may have told us keywords that would appear in their proprietary uh, documents or information, uh, names of products, names of services. So you look at a hard drive image. And by golly, you see a name for a document that is exactly what they were looking for. It's proprietary information there, and it's got a D colon. It looks like an external drive, not the, uh, not the uh, system partition. But it's in unallocated space. Now, this means that uh, at first glance, we may not know what this what this piece of data means other than the fact that it seems to appear referred to an external drive. Uh, furthermore, there's some bad news. Um, the reason it's in unallocated space is uh, we find out that IT deleted their user profile after the employee left. And then they gave the laptop to a new employee, which kind of complicates forensics in terms of attributing this to uh, the next person, di differentiating between the next person that uh, uh, was in possession of the laptop. And this was six months ago. The guy had it for six months. Uh, and, and then on top of that, they had reformatted. Okay? That's... And then they reinstalled. Okay? So this makes it really interesting. So, so what do we know? We've got, in our preliminary report, we know we've got a document in unallocated space. So we look at the surrounding data. 
uh, just as ASCII text or hex, and it looks like a shortcut. Shortcuts have a certain structure and a certain uh, signature at the beginning of the file that we can recognize, so it looks sort of like a shortcut. And uh, shortcuts are useful because they contain a snapshot of the thing that they refer to. So they're kind of like a, uh, a soft link. They point to something, but on Windows they also take a snapshot of uh, timestamps. They take a snapshot of the volume uh, label of the device that it refers to. They take a snapshot of the volume ID, uh, serial number for the volume. So they've got a bunch of stuff that could be unique to whatever device held, the, held that uh, document of interest. So here we, we know we've got something interesting. We've got a, a kind of a lead on an indication that there may be something, that there's something here that would be of use to the client. We want to identify outgoing file transfer. How do we do it? When we know that everything, you know, uh, the file system has been uh, overwritten. The original file system has been overwritten. So some of the things that, that we can do or we can data carve um, for, uh, for various things that hold uh, paths, file paths and time, like time, like uh, shortcuts. Um, and then we can look for things that would have timestamps that might correlate with that. And there are a number of things that are going to contain a wealth of timestamps, things like event logs, the timestamp the events, internet history, uh, which is generated both by the browser and all kinds of applications. Uh, and we mentioned shortcuts. Okay, so now that we know, we know what we need to do, we need to recover all these kinds of information and we know that it's not available through the file system. We're going to go have to. We're going to have to go carve it out. Um, this gives us the motivation to understand the encodings and how the system works. Because the understanding the encodings allows you to un un extract the data. Understanding how the system works and allows you to interpret what you've extracted. So we want to know something about how Vista stores log events and uh, what, what the, uh, how the logging system works and what the, uh, uh, what the events mean. So the process for doing that can be broke. There's a bunch of process models in the literature and uh, this is one view of them that you might extract the data, um, extract records, extract you know, fields from records, analyze them, and then reconstruct what was going on in terms of, and, and interpret uh, what those what those records mean, and we're going to look principally at the the uh, the first part of this, where we recover uh, uh, logs and events, uh, and then they may or may not be valid in terms of the tools being willing to read them. So we may have to deal with uh, repairing or um, reconstituting the log files so that the tools will will uh, manipulate them, and finally correlating all the information. So that's what we want to focus on. So we do so for the we do so for the shortcut, and what do we get? Uh, this is this is actually just the first section of the shortcut, and it holds some standard pieces of information, including what we saw before the path to this file. Uh, it stores the kind of media it was on, CD-ROM, uh, a volume label that looks like a date, serial number, file size, creation dates, last write date, which are a timestamp of those uh, values on the media. So we know more specifically here that it actually is a CD-ROM. So whatever, whatever this file, whatever was going on, this file was being looked at on a CD-ROM. And that's even, so that's... Uh, a little further support for investigating this further if the client is interested in transfer of intellectual property. Um, one of the ways that you might recover whole files are using data carving tools. And there are a number of tools out there. Uh, the most popular are commercial tools because um, the, 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 large, the majority of people doing forensics are in law enforcement and they prefer the, they 
prefer commercial tools. So, uh, so that's why I'm presenting a commercial tool. This is Data Lifter, and it has you know a couple of hundred, two, three hundred signatures for standard formats in there. It does not have event logs. So, if you want to carve event logs, you've got to go and get event logs and figure out what the header is. Put it in the dialog here where you say where it says edit file signature and give it a length. So those are the things that you need to do to recover the logs. Get the signature and get the length. And one way to do that for event logs is to uh, look at a couple of different logs in WinHex. So you pull them into WinHex and say um, synchronize and compare. That's the menu option. And what WinHex does is it takes two files and uh, shows you the first one and highlights all the bytes that are different between the first and second. So all the black boxes you see here are the sections that are different between the two. And you can see the first line, there are no highlighted bytes. So that section of the file is the same and we can use that as a signature. So this is the method that you can use to figure out what the signature is for, for a given file type. Just go grab a couple load them into WinHex, do view and compare. So for XP log signatures, you see this, uh, this byte sequence here. Things change on Vista. And in fact, uh, it's a little bit easier to remember. The signature that Vista event logs uh, start with is ELF file, which is event log file file uh, uh, padded with nulls. So 16 bytes, ELF file. So you put that into... Um, data lifter, tell it uh, a file size. Um, on Vista, the logs are either going to be 64K or a you know, one megabyte plus 64K. So you use the latter. Do the data carving. Hang on. Do the data carving and you may get a whole bunch of logs back from that. So if this machine has been in service for a number of years, uh, say three years, even though it had been, uh, Vista had been, been reinstalled, um, when we do, obviously Vista hasn't been out that long, but when we do this for XP, you may recover uh, 100 logs. So uh, because of the way the system, uh, the, the, because of the way the system behaves in terms of when you, um, uh, clear logs or create a new log or defragmentation occurring. There are lots of ways in which uh, a log, uh, the system will uh, move log files around and leave an old copy. So it's easy when you have a large disk that is underutilized in terms of capacity that you'll find lots of data um, that is uh, lots of old log data. So you might recover a hundred logs and it's very common to have only one or two of them be intact to the, to the extent that the tools will open and read them. So the question then becomes, what do you do to, uh, now that you know you have the 100 of them, what do you do with the ones that appear that the tools refuse to uh, open or, or view? And that's, where, that's, that's one of our motivations for looking at the internals. Vista changes everything. Now, one of the things that we can leverage in understanding how Vista works is the backward compatibility. So with each new revision, they're going to keep some things from the old. And that's going to happen up at this top layer where those green dots are between the DLLs, the libraries, and the application. So there's, some, there's interfaces there that will continue to exist in the new version of the operating system. So there are things about the way XP worked that we can use to reason about how Vista works. And one source for understanding that is this book on event logging. Um, now, Vista changes a whole lot of things. So. Uh, Instead of three or four logs, depending on whether you've got IE7 ex installed, you've got more than 50 by default. Um, and they're dedicated, there's logs for individual services. So there's a whole, a whole wealth of logs there. Uh, and they're in a different location. System 32 Win EVT logs. And they have a new extension, EVTX. 
So uh, we're going to talk about a little bit about why they did this. Um, the new system is in termed, in, intended to solve a lot of performance issues. So they took the old uh, tracing, uh, event tracing for Windows uh, components from 2003, and those are the engine for event logging on Vista. And they do, they do buffering of events in the kernel, circular queues, and uh, to get very high performance to, to do that. Uh, and it unifies logging for both the apps and the kernel, the drivers. Um, there's a richer component architecture to this, where you had an event log service and an application and a, a single log, like the application log, if you, your application was logging. Now you have um, providers that log that may log to uh, channels. They can create new channels dedicated to their uh, service or application. C and collectors may, that can control the flow of events from the uh, channels to log files or uh, remote log, log collection. So you can centralize logging with Vista as well. And some advantages, uh, the other kinds of performance advantages that, that you have because it's buffered into the kernel um, the performance impact is much lower. You can dynamically disable uh, and enable this without rebooting, which is not possible on, on XP. And you can filter the events. So you got lots of, lots of uh, new capabilities. Um, in terms of speed, uh, whereas a, a couple of hundred events might bring XP to its knees, a couple hundred events per second might bring XP to its knees, you can log 20,000 or with tra transactions 200,000 events per second and only use 5% of the CPU on Vista. And this is a big deal for forensics as well because it means that all of a sudden you can, uh, uh, applications and services can use the logs for new things. They can do so, because they can do so with a performance app impact, they may be, be begin to log lots of things that they haven't in the past. Um, the uh, framework is much more flexible um, because it's uh, all they all the interfaces for drivers and the kernel and the applications are layers on top of a of a, a single new uh, a component the event tracing for Windows uh, and it unifies all those interfaces. So from a, from a programming perspective, and this is an, uh, th so understanding how things work, we want to do that so that we can interpret the events, interpret how the system behaves, and be able to, to say, given an event and you know, a few pieces of information, what they really mean and what they, and what they don't. Uh, so we want to understand how the logging service works. And, and this is the new API for logging events. If you have an application and you want to send events to the log, you, uh, the, the the application developer writes a schema and compiles it uh, to be bundled with the application that describes the events. And at runtime, the application registers as its source, it creates a session, and, and it sends those events for, uh, for the schema that it's uh, registered. Uh, and then uh, we've got Vista has, there are very few tools for looking at these things, but the tools that are there have a bunch of new capabilities in terms of uh, the, the new event viewer can filter and um, uh, do a kind of SQL, um, a kind of SQL querying across events, and it can do so both locally and remotely. It can do things so for uh, live events as they're occurring or across multiple log files. Now, if you look at the MSDN documentation, it's going to describe everything as XML, and that's a wonderful thing because XML is is, is neutral in a lot of ways. Um, so this is kind of the kind of structure for an individual event, and it's at the beginning going to have a bunch of, of uh, um, standard properties for things like the name of the service, uh, event ID, IDs, level of severity, those kinds of things that are that are common with XP. And then a bunch of other stuff that, that uh, is uh, potentially an entire XML document specific to the application. 
And that's where things get interesting in that the, uh, the application can defi define a document structure and uh, the, the um, log viewer or analysis software can filter that using XPath to access, you know, walk the tree and look for individual items. So how does the, how does the application um, define that? The, the application def provides a manifest and that provides type information and the structure of the document that it's going to log uh, events as. Uh, providers of events also have a description that, that contains a, a unique GUID and a provider name and it specifies uh, the DLLs that contain some of this information. Uh, just like you have message catalogs on XP, uh, you have resource names and parameter file names for this additional type information on Vista. Uh, and a similar um, a document to define the channel. So a, an application can define a, a dedicated channel for itself to log events to, and then the controller can say, well, I want that everything for that channel either sent to a uh, specific log file or selected parts of that uh, subscribe to to be sent remotely for collection or centrally for collection. Uh, templates define the shape of the, these documents that the, the, uh, the uh, log records uh, are encoded as. So you have XML payload and the templates define the structure of that payload. Um, so the manifest is going to de define uh, all the event attributes such as IT, version, keywords, tasks. Um, it's going to reference a template that we uh, uh, talked about in the last slide and name channels. And one of the reasons for doing this is both to, that it can be used for all kinds of services um, and that uh, you can use it in new ways. So the uh, event logging is guaranteed now because the performance is in so impact is so low. You can guarantee delivery of events. So say a wireless driver can depend on the event logging to send messages to a service to manage uh, uh, networks or VPNs, things like that. And uh, because of that, that will have a form forensics impact in, in, in terms of having uh, records of those kinds of things to use for event reconstruction. So um, we've got high performance tracing. Uh, the events can be forward, forwarded to a collector service or stored locally. Um, they're buffered in the kernel. Uh, they can be delivered as they arrive or um, uh, pushed to a remote machine. So let's look a, lot, a little bit at the encodings, the internals. Uh, the documentation um, talks about this all as XML. Um, the events, so we've got these XML record format for the specific events. Those are held in a section and you'll have in front of a section uh, body a section header that says what size it is, what the what the uh, manifest that you would use to decode it, and then descriptors for each of those sections, um, and then a record header that would hold standard attributes. So this is the f this is the encoding for a new encoding, and it's very different from XP where you have um, basically an array of strings um, or, or uh, an array of data types, a single single array of types. Uh, in the red record header, you have these common attributes such as timestamp and severity. Uh, again, the section descriptors tell you what what source the uh, what provider of the events and the offset and lengths of the of the uh, uh, bodies. Um, and then the the, uh, the header for each body is going to tell you uh, the encoding for the body. Uh, one of the one of the other um, uh, advantages of the new uh, uh, this new architecture is that log size limits are are removed as well. So, on XB, you're limited to about 300 megabytes by the system, and at that size, 
you have a severe performance impact. And that's for all of the logs combined. Um, on uh, Vista, the logging service map memory maps only 64K of the log at a time. And that allows it to have uh, much, you know, basically removes the limitation that uh, 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 of the impact of mapping the whole file on XP. So if you want to recover uh, logs and records on Vista, uh, the, uh, because it maps only 64K, you've got both the structure that you see signature at the beginning of the file, and there's an identifiable structure for each of these what they call chunks, 64K sections that are memory mapped. And if you uh, do the same thing with WinHex that you do for the whole file, um, take two files, load them in at 64K. Well, beyond the f first 4K, if you look at 64K increments past that, you'll see a signature at the beginning of it, each 64K block. And you can potentially use this to recover individual fragments of log records. So even if you can't get the whole file, because these chunks are... Uh, uh, potentially stand alone, the, the events are not going to cross a chunk, you can re recover uh, fragments of logs um, using this signature. So as I said before, the, the, uh, the minimum size for the, uh, the log files, I'm sorry, it's 64K plus 4, 4K for the header, so that would be 68K is the minimum size. So you're going to see uh, a dozen or so, maybe 20 that are that size, and the rest of the logs are one megabyte plus four, 1028. So if you're try trying to data car for them, the easiest thing to do is just uh, give specify a size of 1028 to do the data carving. Now one of the surprising things about the documentation for this is that they, if you look at MSDN, you will get the impression that everything is XML. But if you go look at the encodings of the events, um, it's not XML. What they're using is a thing called binary XML, which is popular for uh, cell phones, web browsers, and geographical data sys da um, databases. And it is a way to encode uh, XML with very lightweight, and that you can put this structure, that put the binary XML in memory and walk it in memory. Um, so it's a it's a kind of serialization. Uh, it's got higher performance or lower performance impact both in space and time. It's very compact in terms of, uh, in that it uses string tables to store all the um, element names and tag names and attribute names. So um, it's compact because of that. And it can be 10 to 100 times faster to parse, because, in part because it can store binary data. So in, in, rather than having uh, numbers represented as ASCII, you can represent them as binary. So if you get heavy numeric data, um, you'll get uh, often get a hundred times, it, it can be a hundred times faster to parse. And that's important for doing the analysis because if you're, if you're looking at uh, a, a, a historical logs over a long period of time, um, the parsing is, will be the limiting factor, performance limiting factor. Okay, so uh, how are they serialized? Um, if you look at the uh, binary XML standard, um, there are they have um, uh, type values that precede individual uh, numbers or strings. So a uh, particular data item is going to be preceded by a type. If it's variable length, it'll it'll have a um, length uh, following the type code. So uh, a value here we've got. Uh, a, a, a num that uh, gives us all the codes for the types, and an integer number where we've got it, uh, uh, would be represented by F4 for the type, and then four bytes for the value. Uh, looking at uh, strings, uh, they'll be preceded by a length and a series of characters. Um, if it's a string table, that would be preceded by a type code that indicates that it's a table. So these are the kinds of things that if you're recovering uh, 
data from within an event, if you've got a fragment, this is the information that you would use to uh, interpret the data. And finally, for, uh, for the XML structure, each element is going to be, uh, in, in the, the tree structure of the document, each element will be enclosed by uh, a beginning tag which has a type code for the element and um, a reference to the string table that tells you the name of the tag and a closing, uh, a closing type code that will tell you where the uh, element ends. Okay, and there are no, no tools as it stands to do this in an automated fashion. So all this stuff, th th these are things that you can use manually, but you cannot yet, uh, th there are not tools yet uh, to do recovery of even uh, of fragments or to repair files, and that's the area that I'm interested in. So uh, if you do, so recovering these files, what, what kind of analysis can you do with them? These new XML events have rich information. Uh, instead of a flat structure with an array of strings, you have a whole a document that can be represented as a tree, and you can do XPath filtering on the elements. So you can have a lot of new kinds of information stored in the events, um, and a lot more detail. And uh, the tools now uh, will do queries across multiple logs, so it's now easier with the native tools of the platform to analyze across, you know, historical, a whole set of log files. And just about the only tool to do that at the moment is the native tool, the event viewer. Uh, and it has these new items to uh, create a custom view uh, or a filter to allow you to do queries on the logs. And you would do so by specifying XPath, which was basically like a directory path. You'd be walking the tree of the document uh, rather than the tree of a file system. So here we've got uh, uh, system slash provider. So that element of the tree equals CD burning service. So let's say we've recovered, along with that shortcut, we've recovered a bunch of these files and we're going to filter them for that kind of event. What might, what might we find? Well, here we've got a table with a series of just a few items from the records, the, the timestamp and the message that was associated with the event. And this is the kind of thing you would see if the native tools are burn, used to burn a CD. So here we've got um, time, a message that says that the uh, uh, burning service has started, uh, messages at basically one minute er intervals saying that the burning service is running, and then a f finally message that says that it's entered the stop test state. And this is consistent with um, th this kind of pattern uh, distinguishes CD burning from the kind of pattern that you see when the system just starts up and starts services. So you'll see the service start when the system boots, and you'll see may see messages about it starting, you know, uh, when the, the, for other reasons, but the uh, messages saying that it's running at one minute intervals distinguishes this kind of pattern from others. And we can combine that with information in the timestamp. So we've got timestamps in the event log, timestamps in the, uh, in the shortcut, and we can co correlate them. And we want to combine that with our understanding of how the system works to say something about what was going on. So we do that. We can, we can look at the correlations and determine that a CD-ROM was burned. We've got a SID in the application log associated with the events. And the timestamps on the events correlate with the timestamps. So we, knew, we know the burning was occurring. And this shortcut refers to the CD that was in the drive at the time it was being burned. We've got a SID in the event log. The shortcut holds uh, a label for the CD that looks like, a time, looks like a date. And we've got a volume serial number. So we can, we can use this to distinguish whether it was just possession of materials that should have been uh, a part of the responsibilities of, of uh, someone using the documents 
or transfer and that we can distinguish that it was CD bur burning that was occurring and we can tell exactly what was burned, a document of interest, we know what size it was, we've got dates, so uh, we can tell, you know, if we had uh, another source for this document, we might be able to correlate those dates and size and name to figure out if it was the same document. So, uh, so uh, we use the information in this timestamp uh, to do that, I mean, and the shortcut to do that. Now there's one thing that about these particular set of timestamps that's somewhat unique to Windows and that Windows, um, when you see a uh, creation time that's later than the last write time, it means something different than on, on other platforms. So we've got a created time that's newer than the last write. How can that happen? Well, that happens when you transfer files from one media to another. It gets created on the new media, but the last time it was written uh, is the last time it was modified. So Windows updates the created time with the time that it lands on the new media, and the last time it was modified is preserved. So we can use that because we, we've got one of the timestamps that was preserved from the old media. We can go look back at various source media to see if we can identify that specific file. And if we can find it, we can say, this file was transferred from this particular source. So by this, we can, so we can do a couple things. We can distinguish whether or not it was transfer in terms of CD burning. We can distinguish maybe if we can find that file on another media file server, some external hard drive, we can tell where it came from uh, relatively uniquely in, in, in that in addition to those timestamps we've got a volume serial number which is unique to, a, unique to each volume. And um, And we've got the uh, timestamp and size to correlate with that individual file. So if those, all those things match for the file and the volume, we can say something about where it was transferred from. Okay, so that's, that's basically it. If you want to know more about doing this on Windows XP, um, there's an article coming out in Digital Investigation in a couple of weeks. I can't make it available till then, but I'd be happy to send it to anyone that's interested. The journal allows authors uh, to distribute electronic versions of the copies. Otherwise, it's 30 bucks from their website or go to the library to get the journal. But I can send that, and I would be happy to send that to anyone who's interested. Um, I'll be talking about these kinds of things at a couple of other conferences, and I would love uh, if to get a chance to chat with you. If any of you will be at um, the uh, George Mason University Forensics Training Symposium next week, or at the Digital Forensics Research Workshop in two weeks, um, and uh, lastly at the High Tech Crime Investigators Association International Conference at the end of the month in San Diego. So, thanks very much for your patience. I appreciate it, and I hope you found this valuable.